Um, I'd like to introduce our next um, speaker, who is Roshi Sweeney, um, who's going to talk to us about standards in craft education and the role of accrediting bodies. And um, Roshi um, comes to us from Kinshaka for a national accrediting body. Thank you very much, um, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Firstly, I'd just uh, like to extend a, a thanks to the Crafts Council for uh, inviting um, representation from FETAC here this afternoon. And um, um, after hearing all the good things that are going, have been going on or under a plan, I'm afraid my bit is kind of the, the slightly more mundane end of the business, folks, but uh, bear with me. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is, without getting into sort of more organisational issues or whatever, I'm trying to put this presentation in the context of the Craft Council's report, the kind of information that they um, put into it and some of the recommendations that came out of it, and to try and put it in the context of uh, hopefully a, a fruitful relationship between the Craft Council, between FETAC and between providers. So but just to give you a context of, of where FETAC is coming from, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the awards and qualifications that we have in the craft area and then a little bit about how we're changing and how we're, how our, uh, we're going to be developing standards for awards in the future. So, um, so I just want to outline, you see a slide, very heavily awarded slide there, but just a few key points out of it. Is that we have a strategic plan which brings us up to 2011. Now in reality, after that date we won't exist because in the last budget, FETAC, PTAC, the Higher Education Training Wars Council, and our parent body, if you like, the National Qualifications Authority, we were all marked down for amalgamation, and that's going to happen. It's, it's in train, there's consultation happening on it, there's a change in legislation required, and the, the expected date is, um, the earliest is probably the end of 2010, but it certainly will have to happen by beginning, middle of 2011. And so there'll be, those three bodies will come together and there'll be an entity um, whose working name at the moment is Qualifications Ireland, but I don't know if that's going to be the actual name. Um, and it actually, it, it does make sense that, 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 that those three bodies come together um, because we're all working towards the, the, the national framework. But just for the moment, to bring things back to where we are at the moment and what FETAC is trying to do is, we have, irrespective of amalgamation and so on, we have goals that we have to achieve to help um, provide um, quality assured qualifications for people, for learners and for providers to be able to take those qualifications, take the standards associated with them and devise their programmes. So we have a main goal, a key one, and this is my job at the moment, is having a comprehensive suite of awards in place. Now that's across all areas of learning, okay? Um, everything from agriculture to services, hospitality to crafts and so on. Um, they're not, we're not working with the blank canvas, obviously, because we already have a whole um, portfolio of awards in there. Um, but we are looking at them and we're trying to move them into a new format that will make them um, comprehensive, that will make them more widely available to some extent than they are at the moment. And we also have other key um, uh, issues around them that we have to bear in mind. And one is that our awards will be not only nationally recognised but internationally recognised. So when learners go abroad in whatever field, whether it's a craftsperson, a mechanic, a um, farmer or whatever, when they bring their FETAC award, it has meaning in the receiving country that they're going to. And that, those sort of measures are already in place through the likes of the, the, Europe, um, the Euro certificate, certificate Supplement, Europass Certificate Supplement and so on, about helping uh, learners um, in their mobility. Um, also, a key issue is that when learners achieve a FETAC award, that they can go somewhere with it. When I say go somewhere, it means either they can progress into um, uh, another uh, award at, at a higher level, or they can move into an area at the same level, they can move into employment, or indeed that they're getting personal satisfaction out of it. So that, the, the, that our awards are not what I would call cool to sack awards. You know, you get it and then you're kind of going, oh, where do I go from here? That there are pathways for people. Um, and in order to do that, of course, we have to build um, strong relationships with education and training providers. And we currently have, just to give you an idea of the scale of, of things, uh, FETAC has currently just under 800 registered providers. Um, and that equates to roughly 1,500 centres. Okay. So when I talk about a registered provider, 
I could be talking about the likes of FOSS, which is a huge entity, very well resourced, has a national remit. It, we regard FOSS as one provider. It has loads and loads of centres associated with it. The VC sector, and I think a lot of you are familiar with if you come from today, um, the secondary level sector, all the VCs are registered with us, and some of their, we have uh, I think a total of 99 agreements with various VCs, and these, the centres that, that fall out of those, if you like. But we also have other sectors that are, are other types of providers. We have increasingly those from the private sector um, who are now able to register with us. We have a huge number of providers from the community and voluntary sector as well. So when you talk about a FETAC registered provider, you could be talking about an entity that is very large and well-resourced down to quite a small entity that is, um, is running on its own energy and fuel, if you like. But the key point is that all of them, in terms of their registration with us, they've gone through the same process. We ask them the same questions. The difference between the small and the big and the huge is the complexity of the systems they have to have in place. And when I talk about systems, I'm talking about that they have policies around things like communications with learners, around how to design programs, that they have uh, procedures around that. They have procedures on how they'll assess learners and so on. So, and the, the, the registration process if you like, is the first step, as I describe to people, um, it gets you in the room. Become a FETAC registered provider, you get in the room and on the shelf there's all these different awards that you can potentially have access to. Um, if you're not in the room, you don't get access to it. Okay? Um, but in order for all those things to work, we, the registration is the first thing. We then have to make awards available that providers and learners will want to to use um, and to, to get value from. And you know, we'd have to admit ourselves that you know we have gaps in our system and this is one of the things we're now trying to, to fill and hopefully arising out of situations um, and events like today, we can start to build those relationships that will help us fill those gaps. Um, so providers register with us, they get access to awards and one of the new things for those of you who are providers in the room is coming down the, the, the line is in the future we'll have another um, process which is called validation of programs. And I don't want to get into the detail of that, but in terms of quality assurance of what providers are doing, it's, if you like, the last piece is slotting into the, the jigsaw. Registration being one, awards being second, and validation of programs being third. And all of this really is, is part of our um, like closing the circle in terms of the quality assurance end of thing. So from FETA's perspective, what are we trying to do? We're trying to develop national standards. And that's a key point. And I have a slide, I think it's the one after this, that kind of shows the relationship between FETAC providers and learners. Because as to be fair, it, people interpret in different ways. You know, and sometimes we think we're not being reactive or proactive or sufficiently responsive, but it's really about where the responsibility lies on things. So our key aim is to have national standards in place, that they're based on a development process that has quality behind it, that is, um, has all the relevant players involved in it. We absolutely acknowledge straight up, we don't have the resources or the expertise in-house to develop standards in all the areas that we have to do to develop them. And we need relationships with the likes of yourselves, with the likes of the craft councils and other similar bodies. We need to be able to draw on that expertise. We also need at the moment to be able to rationalise some of the areas that we have. We have um, certain levels in certain areas, we have duplicate awards because of where they came from and how we inherited them. So we're trying to rationalise um, and do away with duplication. We're trying to come up with a common format for them, okay? because again, depending on what type of provider you are, you've had access to certain types of things and not to others. And uh, it can be, um, it's not fully um, coherent, shall we say. The other key thing, and this is an important one, I think, to be aware of, is how learners can achieve FETAC awards. And they can do that by achieving what we call a major award, which would be a big award, if you like. But in order to get that, they first have to get the minors associated with it. So our whole system is based on accumulating minor awards. And in that accumulation, you achieve, and depending on the particular area, whether it's in crafts or IT or business or whatever, when you get the correct combination of minors together, then you achieve the major. And the value for the learner in that is that if for some reason they, they, they may well go in and do a full-time program through a VC provider, 
and that's fine, all well and good. But equally, they may do module by module, one or two, three maybe a year, or one at a time over a number of years. But the point is, when they get the appropriate combination, they can still get the award. So it's very much about building up uh, awards to get the, the major. We're trying to look at uh, scheduling, planning, development in a much more proactive way rather than reactive. Um, and that from that then, providers will be able to devise programs or courses, if you want to call them, that suit the context and the profile of their learners. Um, but that the programs are, are allowing those learners to, to reach um, the standard of the, the national award. Now the whole context for all of what I'm talking about is this, which is the national framework of qualification. You're probably sick of seeing it at this stage, but coincidentally it will be six years in existence next month. Okay? And to be frank, I think it's just beginning to come into its into its you know maturity, shall we say, because we've seen it in some of the presentations, some of the talk earlier, and in other environments where you hear now people talking about levels. Well, this is what they're talking about. If they're talking about level nine, they're talking about up there on the right hand side. If they're talking about level five, it's to do with the framework. Um, so that all those bodies currently in there, in terms of awarding bodies, you've got ourselves in green, FETAC operating at levels 1 to 6. You've got our colleagues HETAC operating at levels 6 to 10. DIT also at that, and then university starting at level 7 and up to 10. And then you have the likes of the State Examination um, Commission representing the Department of Education with the awards, the, the junior certs and the leading certs at 3, 4 and 5. So this is where all qualifications now are, are leading to. And the purpose of this framework is really to, it's what's called an outcomes-based framework. It's about what knowledge, what skill, what competence the learner has achieved in their given area. That the qualification that they achieve, whether it's a minor, a combination of minors, a major, that it demonstrates a level of knowledge, skill and competence appropriate to whatever level of the framework in a particular field of learning. Um, and we've actually, or we as a feedback, but Ireland has been a, a leader in this area in terms of influencing on a European basis what the European Qualifications Framework looks like. So this is what we're all working to feel like. So when people are talking about qualifications, they're talking about something that sits somewhere within those ten levels. Okay. But what are they? This is a little bit of the detail, but I, I just want to flag it with you. Um, within each of those levels, we have four possible award types. So when we talk about craft awards, we could be talking about um, a major award. Um, in, and I think some of the figures you'll see later on, we're talking about, there's one, I think the, the most used PTAC award at level five is art, craft, and design. That's a major award. But it's made up of minors, okay? Which have painting, drawing, ceramics, so on. Um, so the features of the framework are, are that you, have a, you can have a major award, which is made up of minors, and two new ones, and this might be something that could be of interest, maybe in this area, in terms of craftspersons or people trying to get additional qualifications, is in the area of supplemental awards and uh, special purpose awards. Now, they're relatively new in terms of um, people's awareness of them, and we wouldn't have a, a huge amount of them compared to the major awards we have. But the point of them being is a supplemental award is a bit what it, how it's the title suggests is supplemental to something else. So if you have a major award in something already, you can get it. If you want to do a smaller piece of, of learning um, you can, um, that is in the same area, the same field of learning, you can get a, a supplemental award out of it. Or indeed what's called special purpose, which is around more narrowly defined. Sometimes this is driven by uh, specific economic requirements or specific legislation. Anyway, the point of showing you this is about the system and the th kind of things to be aware of in the system within the framework and some of the language that you're you're going to be um, starting to hear but in terms of when someone's talking about I have a level five major award you know what that means uh, it could be the lead insert but it could be a certificate in art craft and design okay um, and indeed as time goes on and we start to populate the framework with more special purpose and supplemental awards you'll start to hear those so just to give you an indication of what they are um, just to kind of show you or reiterate the relationship between ourselves as an awarding body, what our role is versus the role of the education and training provider and then 
where that fits in with our, both our relationships with the learner. So our job as a FETAX is to put in place the qualifications that are required in you know, the craft area, for example. And we do that by designing what are called standards for awards. And when we talk about standards, we're talking about knowledge, skill, and competence. So they're what are known as learning outcomes. It's what the learner will be able to do. So it's not the inputs, okay? The inputs come from the provider. The FETAC awards are all about what the learner is going to be able to do, or should be able to do. And one of the key things we're trying to implement, implement now is that standards are written in such a way that they're independent of the learning context. So that they're written in such a way that they don't necessarily have to be only delivered in one type of environment, as in the classroom, or only online, or only through workshop or whatever. That they're written with enough breadth and enough depth that providers can design their programs to deliver them relative to the context of the learner, the profile of the learner, in a range of environments. Because it doesn't make sense to have too many what I would call niche type awards. You know? so, our job then is to put in place those qualifications. Some of them you know already, they're on the framework like the, level five, the one I mentioned earlier, Level 5 Art Craft and Design, and numerous others. What happens with those? Well, the providers out there who are registered with us can take those standards and design their program. So there's responsibility for the program, for the course content, sits with the provider. Remember I said earlier they have to be registered with us. In registering with us, they, they, they put in place, a, if they don't already have them, they put in place a set of procedures around how they will do this sort of thing, how they will design their program, how they will um, recruit staff, how they will assess learners, and so on. Okay? So the program end is the, the pr provider's responsibility. And then between what FITAC has said in terms of assessment for the particular subject area, the provider then puts in place the actual instrument for assessment. Because at the end of the day, the learner, put it frankly, only gets the FETEC award when they've been assessed and they've passed the assessment. Okay? It's not for attendance, it's for you know, attendance, learning, reflection, and assessment. Okay? So the provider's job is to put in place the program and the assessment. And hopefully with those two elements, FETEC standards, provider's program and assessment, the learner undergoes the training, education program, whatever length it is, and they're assessed and they walk away with a fee tank award. And from the learner's perspective, they know there's substance behind it in terms of the standards, they know there's substance behind it in terms of the provider and how they put, they put the program together. Um, from an employer's perspective, if that's the route the learner wants to go, they know where this is, what, what it is, where they can identify it on the framework. Um, from the learner's perspective, if they want to move into higher education, there are established routes for them into that which can always still be improved, of course. You know? So that's just the, the kind of relationship. Now these numbers are not gospel. These are ones I took off our database. Um, well, they, they are accurate, sorry, I shouldn't say they're not gospel. The reason I put uh, level three and four um, is that we don't have specific major awards in that area. It is an area we're starting to look at, but we do have a huge number of learners who get minor awards in each of those, at each of those levels. Um, we do have, at level five is, if you like, the, the, the bulge in our system around craft awards. That's where the most are, are available. So you can see there that the, when I talk about a major award, I'm talking about a, a certificate, okay? Um, which seems a very small name for a very, very big achievement, but that's, that's the, the formal title of them. So a certificate in art, craft and design, you'll see over the last, uh, since 2007, 815 learners have achieved the full award. Now, what I haven't put in the column to the right here is you would find that there's probably a multiple of that of people who've achieved the minors associated with that. This is saying the, the people who have actually achieved the full award, but there could be, you know, uh, probably several thousand who are currently building up their credits towards the, the major. And you see the other, I put them here in terms of uh, level five in terms of numbers, art as well, big numbers there. Interior design, that's been a growing area. Fashion design, furniture design, um, design per se, creative craft, jewelry, manufacturing, repair. Now these are the, the minor, the, sorry, the major awards. Behind each of those 
there's a structure that has minor awards in things like you know ceramics, painting, um, numerous uh, minor awards, and so on. Then at level six, which is a much, as you'll see from the numbers, don't be shocked by the, the disparity of numbers here. Level six is a much um, uh, less well-developed area. There are awards have been put in place in the last couple of years, but they're only now getting out there and starting to be used. So you can see there things like art, metal work, creative ceramics, furniture making and restoration, and so on. Um, small numbers, but potentially growing. Now, everything I've shown you here in terms of numbers is um, in terms of awards, and they're in, uh, they're generally in what some of you have known that is known as the NCBA system, or they're out of the FOSS system, okay? What we're now trying to do is bring everything into, what I mentioned earlier, as a common format. So we're now starting to look at particular, what we call fields of learning, subject areas, in other words. And craft is one that we're, we're going to be looking at, uh, hopefully shortly as well. And we're going to be looking at the awards that are there, and translating them into this new format, and possibly developing new areas as well, where areas where they're there's a requirement or a need, and that's where I would hope the relationship with the of the craft councils and providers and so on will help us um, do that. So bringing this back to the, the report by the, the, the council, um, we'd like to see, and we will pursue after today, the relationships with the craft council um, in terms of standards development. Um, very briefly, just to explain what that means, we have, in terms of um, the new model for developing standards is uh, where it's appropriate to put together what's known as a standards development group. And it has a remit to work in a particular area and to develop awards across levels. You know, so they're not just looking at one thing at one level, they would be looking at, say for example, in the craft area, looking at all of those awards that are there and moving them into a new format and identifying where there are gaps, and if there are gaps, prioritising the development of them. And it would be you know, the, the, the work of the actual standards development would be done by what we call subject matter experts, but it's brought back to that group, overall group, for agreement, okay? Now, it sounds slightly cumbersome, but the point of it is that it's about getting the people who know the subject area involved in the standards development, okay? Um, and it's, a, it's a, an approach that we've um, started um, last year, and we're refining it as, as we go on. Um, so that's one area where I certainly think we can, as a FETAC, uh, would be welcome input from the Crafts Council and other appropriate bodies. Uh, one of the other recommendations that came out of the report I noted was about progression pathways to third level, about enhancing those. And just for information, there are, there are, there are already established links from level five, a lesser extent from level six, but certainly from level five through what's known as the higher education link scheme. I'm sure some of you are probably fairly familiar with that, which is where what I would call receiving institutions, i.e. institutes of technology or universities, have already identified appropriate awards for people um, from the FETEC system that will give them potential access into higher certificates, um, uh, honours degrees, or, or so on. But of course, that, that can all be um, enhanced as well. So that really is a very quick run through, if you like, um, where we're coming from in terms of uh, a national body with a role in standards development and a role in working with uh, sectoral bodies and representative bodies. Um, it's an exciting time, um, and I think hopefully uh, out of all of this, we're, we can all be assured that whether individuals, learners who want to progress in the third level, or indeed cross people who want to maybe gain upskill in certain areas, that hopefully we will have awards in place for them um, to access, and the providers will as well. Okay, very quick. Yeah, come to a screeching halt there. Do I? Oh, there, standards development. Yeah, this is just a bit about the process that we that we have. I mentioned the standards development group. We have a process then of, of approving things. Okay, thank you. If anyone has, if anybody has any specific questions, um, want to be happy to try and. Um, I'm uh, just keen to hear your thoughts on, it looks like um, 
would have always been heavily involved in accrediting, if you like, practical skills, yes. i.e., and craft very much falls into that area, which is completely different than accrediting more academic or theoretical based programs. So, just hinting with your thoughts on um, any kind of changes in that area given what you're going through if you're amalgamating with PhD tank, etc., um, because that would be something I think that would be mm. of huge potential value to the whole area of craft mm. and retaining that practical element I think would be very important. Okay, can I just go back to this slide here just to. Um, you're right, in, when, when we talk about, you're talking about um, practical skills, should we say, we would talk about practical skills being assessed, okay? Um, within our, our um, standards process, development process, we would have a range of what we would call appropriate assessment techniques. So when we're devising standards, we're looking at not only the what knowledge should someone have or what skill or what competence, it's also related to how that can then be assessed. So. When we write standards, we're also writing indicators of how the assessment should be. So it would be, and, and we're very careful about ensuring that the assessment technique is appropriate to whatever the learning outcomes are. So if someone is supposed to be able to, you know, um, uh, turn a piece of wood in order to create a, a bowl, then clearly that can't be done in a paper exercise. That has to be done, you know, through a, I think it's a lathe. And so on. So yes, we would be saying um, there has to be a skills demonstration involved. Now, what we'll say is it should be, it may uh, account for a certain percentage of the overall um, standard. Um, we might give some indication as to um, uh, what it could contain, but what we don't do is say it has to be a bowl of X dimensions by Y dimensions made of such and such material. That's up to the provider, and that's up to that's where the the, the flexibility from the provider's perspective comes in. That they can, in designing the program and designing the assessment, they'll put the detail in behind. And I think Derek mentioned earlier about when you give a brief to students, you'll get potentially back 28 or 29 different things, and that's the value of it. The point is, in each of those assessments, the learner should have been able to demonstrate through the assessment that they've achieved the, the competence or the skill in that area. Yeah. Okay, thank you folks. <laughs>